And uh, yeah, very warm welcome to this uh, special Siebel Friday. It's uh, Siebel Friday on Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving. So uh, yeah, shout out to the US colleagues who made it here today. Uh, and yeah, we have a the usual uh, startup sequence is to take a look at the latest developments in Siebel CRM. So that is uh, looking at uh, 23.10 and 23.11. So that, that'll be my part. And then I'll hand over to Saravana from SoftClouds to give you an update on the SoftCloud Siebel survey. We're all waiting anxiously on those results. And after that, it's... Uh, yeah, Alex, uh, sorry to interrupt, Alex. Uh, I'm not going to show the civil survey details. I like, you know, still it's in progress. Oh. Probably once I get that. So today we are going to talk about generative AI with civil. Okay, sorry, that uh, was my, my mistake. I thought the survey is finished. <laughs> yeah, okay, no, but no. it's apparently not. Okay, so, but we'll get some other uh, important updates from SoftClouds and also James McDonald and some... Somebody else from GMC is here? I, yes, it's Aaron. It's yeah. both Aaron, Aaron, Aaron hi, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Aaron, you're doing you're doing the the presentation later. Yeah, yeah, we'll do. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, and we have an update from GMC. They have something exciting to share as well. All right. So, with that, let me share my screen. And yeah, let's talk about the uh, latest developments in Siebel. Uh, as we have missed uh, the October Siebel Friday, I have missed it. Uh, and so there was none. So we talk about 23.10 first. It will be rather quick because 23.10, uh, yeah, it had some features as you can see on the list. Uh, let's dive right into the first one. Yes, <laughs> Web Tools gets uh, two more wizards. If you get beyond 23.10, you have, um, yeah, you the, the object window gets a little bit crowded there uh, with the pick list and MVG wizards. We we all we all uh, love these wizards, right? From uh, from Siebel Tools and yeah, I did a quick test. They they work just as fine in Web Tools. Um, bringing more functionality to the browser, which is always good. And uh, then there's a bookshelf update. And um, a bookshelf update means that a parameter has been documented, which might have been there earlier. And uh, this is uh, called turn on version detection on DR. So it's uh, supposedly a DR uh, related parameter. Um, honestly, I turned it on and turned it off. I didn't find much difference, but it's probably because I have a test environment only. So would like to hear if anybody has encountered this parameter already, has used it. Uh, it's, its purpose is to enable a similar way of detecting configuration changes in the runtime Actually, I think it, it's in the runtime repository of the design of the design environment, and literally reload the repository cache for non-UI components that includes EI object manager, workflow process manager. So it should be should be helpful when you have a lot of changes on, let's say, workflows, and you test them uh, on your development environment. Because on the RR environments, there is a similar mechanism already in place. Uh, since 23.1, you, you do your incremental or full migration or more probably incremental migration and then uh, the object managers and components just uh, reload the cache automatically. So this is now on the DR. Anyone has any experience with that? No? Don't, as always, the chat is open, so you can put your experience with that in the chat or your, your comments. Always welcome. All right. And uh, one other thing I noticed when applying 23.10 or when you apply uh, 23.11 at that or any higher version, 
the repository upgrade itself. It's you know it's optional. The repository upgrade is always optional, but uh, of course the the longer you wait with the repository upgrade, the more <laughs> uh, things you get into your repository. And with twenty three dot ten, Oracle has added quite a bunch of objects, actually hundreds, uh, which is the whole. I, I guess it's the whole um, representation of the non-extensible objects, which are usually hidden away from site uh, in a DLL. Uh, but now they become part of the design repository. So with the purpose of not still not being extensible, so you can still not edit them. Well, you can, but you won't see anything, uh, any changes. They're still driven by the DLL, but you can see how they're made up. Like the business services, you can see the methods and and whatnot. So it uh, is um, an interesting uh, change in the repository upgrade that I noticed. Again, any comments or or questions are welcome. Okay. It'll be interesting to see though, that's for sure. Uh, Nick, yeah? Yeah, yeah it'll be interesting to see those because you know, we're still at 1710. On our oh, your process. repository version is 1710. Okay. Um, <laughs> right. I saw a doc ID related to NEO. A customer had added a button to one of the administrative screens, I, I believe, for inbound REST services or oh. outbound REST services, uh, perhaps. Yeah, I've seen that too. I've seen that too. <laughs> Yes, yes. So, uh, you know, it's it's overall a great thing, but uh, we do need to keep that mind going forward that we may not have that uh, flexibility to uh, enhance certain administrative functionality. Right. Like, uh, even if it's even if it's uh, in the repository now, or visible, or even editable in a in a workspace, it's still a neo, mm -hmm. and, and it's oftentimes it's hard to understand is it a neo or not. Uh, uh, unless it's an applet or few, because those are marked in, in the about few dialog. But let's say a business service is not clearly marked as an EO. Okay. Yeah, uh, point. yeah but still a good thing that the visibility or the, the uh, ex, would you say explorability <laughs> uh, that increases with uh, this change. Um, and in 23.11, there's, uh, well, another post-install database update and another repository upgrade if you decide to do it. And officially, there are no features in 23.11. Um, I made out one documentation change. It might not be, might be, it might be also be available in older versions, but in 23.11, it's fully documented and includes some of these NEOs, which are now included in the design repository in the during the repository upgrade. So uh, here I call this workflow instance perch as a service <laughs> because um, I worked in the past with a customer. They tried to administer workflows automatically or through CI CD, but that was back in IP 15, IP 16. And so we use the workflow admin service, which is a great service ever since. It's not a new service by any means. And uh, that has bulk activation, which of course is useless now in uh, if you're higher up than 20.7 with workflows being workspace enabled. But Oracle has added a new method called purge WF instances, purge workflow instances. And it seems to do what says on the tin it automates, or you can now programmatically call that purge of the thousands or hundreds of thousands of records that pile up in your monitoring tables. You know, when you enable the monitoring for workflows, uh, sometimes you forget that you have enabled it. <laughs> okay, Nick. <laughs> uh, and so you enable that you forgot, uh, you you forgot to, uh, to disable the monitoring and uh, the records have piled up and it's time to clean up the tables. There's a button in the, in the administrative view, of course, but now there's a business service method. Okay, cool. So you can call it any way you like, including REST APIs or hen. That's why I call it as a service. And 
you get to see that method only when you run the repository upgrade, which is optional. But then I noticed similar pattern to 2310. You uh, can see it uh, in the in Siebel tools or web tools. Of course, you can still see it, for example, in the business service simulator without running the repository upgrade. It's obviously a non-extensible object. And uh, there's the same functionality now, or very parallel functionality for tasks, for task-based UI. So they too have a monitoring setting. They too produce instances, instance records, and we can now purge them um, using uh, the service. It's actually the method has been added to the task log cleanup service, a longstanding uh, service in task UI. And that has a new method called purge task instances. So again, it's very similar to what we discussed with the workflow admin service gets a new method and is now fully documented and is imported during repository upgrade. So you can actually see it in the design repository, but the service is obviously then uh, Neo. Okay, um, I see Brian and John have joined us. Uh, welcome. <laughs> uh, Nice to have you. And uh, yeah, the final thing, uh, the final um, thing that is not really related to Siebel uh, applications like you run on-prem, it's the cloud manager, which can of course put your application on OCI. And Siebel cloud manager gets regular updates on a monthly basis or sometimes even twice a month. I've seen that. And the recent update includes the ability for Siebel Cloud Manager to automatically deploy the migration application in the migrated environment uh, during a lift and shift. So that's um, obviously a good thing to have. So you don't have to do it manually after the lift and shift. Okay, so uh, that's... Uh, the update on 23.10 and 23.11, uh, as I said, it is uh, quick because there's not really a lot to tell. Um, any any comments, questions before we uh, open the stage for Saravan? A uh, real quick one on the Neo objects. Do they have a special prefix so we can see them easily or sort them out or whatever? So, so um, Okay. Not right. Brian, you take that up. <laughs> No, not on this, not at this time. There is, um, I don't know if it's there yet. There is an XML based catalog um, that uh, we have internally. I've asked that it be shipped. Right now it's pre compiled. You'll see a file called neo.cat. Uh -huh. And it's, um, that's like a pre compiled version of what's neo. There's also a neo XML, which we use internally to compile that catalog. Uh, which I asked to be shipped so that you could just look in there and that would be in the Siebel server bin folder. I don't know if that's happened yet, but... Um, okay, something to uh, check out. You know, if there's, But if there's a particular object um, that you're interested in, you know, let me know. If it's, if, if it's available in the UI, you can just do a help about record and see it. But um, Yes, if anyway. it's a UI object like views, applets, or PC, business, everything that's in about view is, is marked in about view as a Neo, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you very much, Brian. And uh, so I'll stop my sharing. So I hand over now to uh, uh, Saravan. Are you there? Yeah, Saravan. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Alex. From Let Soft Cloud, you should be able to share. Yes, you're sharing already. So let's yeah, hear you're it. able to see my screen, right? Yes. Okay, thanks, thanks, Alex. Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Vernon, and I'm the SAP Cyber Practice Lead for Soft Clothes. Today, we are going to talk about generative AA with Cyber and the Soft Clothes Cyber Innovation Lab activities, whatever we do in our own innovation lab. And let me start from here. So, overall, you know, from the generative AA perspective, it refers to a models or algorithms that creates a brand new output such as text photos, videos, code, data, or 3D renderings from the large amount of data that they are trained on. The model generate 
new content by referring back to the data that have been trained on making new predictions. So generative AI goes beyond the limitation and uh, it strives to create a new entirely a new data that resembles human creates content. And uh, let me navigate to the next slide. Yeah, overall, if you all know about that, we all know about this one, right? Like, you know, from the AA, we have the machine learning, natural language processing, and, you know, there are three things, expert system, overall, from the artificial intelligence perspectives. There are three stages of artificial intelligence. The first one is ANA, artificial narrow intelligence, and it's just a pro program, uh, it's a program to perform a single task whether it is checking the weather or being to play chess or analyzing any raw data to write a journalist report. And ANA can attend to task in the real time, but they pull the information from the specific data sets. And if you look at the current surrounding systems, surrounds like you know, Nero A, like you know, uh, Google Assistant, Google Translate, Siri, Cortana, they all are being used and they are all part of narrow EA. And the stage two, currently we are on stage two. It's a, like, you know, strong EA refers to the machine that exhibits human intelligence. If we talk about in other words, AJ can successfully perform any intellectual task that human can. The, this sort of the EA that we see in movies like uh, her or scientific movies like um, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, Iron Man movies and uh, uh, the human talks interacts with the machine and the operating system that are conscious, sentient, and driven by the emotions and self awareness. Currently, you know there are uh, like you know, they can do, they can create the contents and it can create you, you know, it can come up with the new ideas. But uh, from the human perspective, you know, uh, we we have superior knowledge than the current system what we have today and um, AGA it can solve the problems and it can make a judgment under uncertainty plan learn integrate prior to the knowledge in decision making and be innovative and imaginative and creative and the third one is artificial super intelligence that is our future and uh, it can create, it, it can, you know, uh, will surpass the human intelligence in all aspects from creativity to general wisdom, problem solving, and it can be capable of exhibiting intelligence that we can't, we haven't seen the brightness amongst us, brightest among us. And uh, like, you know, but right now, if you talk about the Elon Musk, uh, think it will lead the existence of the human race. And overall, like, you know, we can create the content that we can generate the music and it, it refers that, you know, whatever we have uh, in the system creates that information based on the information, it can generate the new content, everything. And the growth of the generative AI stats and, uh, you know, it's going to be, you know, increase a lot in the upcoming years. And this particular slide we have taken it from the economical potential of generative AI from a and company so if you take overall look you know at a high level it's going to increase the uh, productivity from 2.8 percentage to 4.7 percentage from the you know industrial annual income like uh, and uh, uh, from the cons consumer packaged goods serve sectors uh, that you know it's going to increase from 400 billion to 600 billion, 600 plus billions. Uh, and this is our current status of generative AI. And generative AI, it's been used for machine learning advancement, natural language processing, and autonomous systems, like uh, it's self-driving cars, drones, companies like Tesla, way more testing self-driving cars on public roads, showcasing the potential of AI to revolutionize transportations and it does the healthcare revolutions and uh, like you know you can direct the disease and uh, you know from disease this detection to drug discovery also it can do and AI algorithm is helping doctors to diagnose illness and more accurately 
and speeding up drug development processes. And there are personalized experience, like, you know, from the user experience perspective, also EA plays a huge among, you know, bigger roles. And uh, it can, you know, uh, from e-commerce sites to use EA algorithms to tailor suggestions based on the user performance and behaviors. And there are a couple of limitations and bias concerns uh, we can talk about in the upcoming slides. And let's talk about the generative AI with Siebel. So far, we talked about the overall generative AI features and the limitations uh, at a high level. So for when we talk about generative AI and Siebel, it can like you know, easily uh, integrate with Siebel and it can give a huge, you know, uh, 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 it can, uh, you know, uh, it does the you know, pivotal role from the Siebel perspective. And it can, you know, from the, you know, it can improve the 61 percentage of employees currently use or they are planning to use Gen AI. And, you know, it does the customer service interactions, everything. Let's go to the next slide. From the Siebel modernizing perspective, so we need to adapt the latest technologies and we need to enhance the UI by using OpenAI and other concepts. And we need to upgrade or migrating our applications and technology platforms and transitioning capabilities to the cloud, integrating and acquisition, establishing new business capabilities and standardized process, consolidating operations and aligning with our Oracle product directions and reducing the complexity of IT applications and technology. So these are, you know, we can consider as part of civil modernization. And from the Gen AI with civil benefits, it can, you know, uh, provide a lot of benefits to the Siebel and it can chat intelligently with users based on the prayer tickets and it can provide solutions and it can interact conversations, it can provide interactive conversations and it guides the user step to step solutioning to the problems and hand over the service personnel when it is needed and it can you know, it can predict the sales predictions and uh, dynamic pricing strategies. Everything can be done. And we are currently working on the Gen AI, what we have uh, in Siebel, uh, sorry, in soft clothes. We have built a tool called Capture and we are integrating with Siebel to see what other you know, things can be achieved from using the Capture, integrating Capture with Siebel. We are working on it from the soft clothes. And, uh, from the service request perspective, like you know, it, it can chat you know, from the chatbot. It can chat in, you know, as I mentioned, it can chat easily with the users, and it can provide twenty four by seven support, and it can answer frequently asked questions and help customer support troubleshoot issues. And e commerce perspective, the chatbot help the customers to find the products, make purchase, and track their orders, whatever they have ordered. And healthcare also, the chatbots can do the appointment scheduling, medication reminders, and patient data collections, banking as well. Like, you know, it can check the customer's account balance, transfer funds, and apply their loans. And marketing, it can chat the customers to engage, you know, provide personalized recommendations and collecting their feedbacks. And knowledge mining from the service request. So based on the service request, whatever has been created in the Siebel system or any system, like, you know, uh, for, now I'm not going to talk about the Siebel. So when uh, Jenny, what it does, it can crawl the information from the service request and it can create the content, like, you know, knowledge management uh, you know, the content based on their customers, uh, users request, and it can, you know, provide the details and it can automatically translate their, you know, language in terms of you know any language it can translate and uh, it can improve their customer searching hours like you know from this 3.6 every day if you overall if you think about it the customer users customers or users can search in google 3.6 hours a day to find the details it can provide you know productivity to reduce their time also and there are a couple of risks involved when we are you know, integrating with the Gen A, that, are, that we will talk about later. And the sales use case, Gen A sales use case, 
It's a powerful tool that can help sales teams to save time and sell more efficiently. And uh, it can prioritizing the best leads, identifying the opportunities that are on track or the risk and highlighting the importance, email, and finding the colleagues connected to the important contacts and increasing the forecast and like, you know, accuracy. And overall, the NWA can analyze customer feedback, reviews, and social media comments uh, to weigh their sentiment and identify potential issues or opportunities. The information, this information helps the customer sales teams address customer concerns capitalize on their positive feedbacks and tailor their messages, sales messages to resonate with their target audience. And there are a couple of sales use cases, like, you know, it can analyze wealth customer data to generate personalized product recommendation on a purchase history. And it can analyze the conversations and provide the coaching to the sales teams. And they can generate the AI algorithms, can analyze customer feedback, reviews, and social media comments, as I mentioned earlier, weigh their customer sentiments and identify potential issues or opportunities. And it can provide uh, many things, like you know, to the user perspective and sales team perspective, it does uh, give uh, you know, potential information to them. And field service. It can, you know, easily integrate with our civil field service and can provide the predictive maintenance and it can, you know, it can schedule, like, you know, optimize scheduling persons and it can do the automating the dispatching and remote assistance, like uh, a, this A can use to provide remote assistance to field service technicians, like, you know, for the augmented reality and other technologies, JDT A can help technician diagnose and repair issues more quickly and accurately. Finance. Uh, so financial, uh, like, you know, uh, it provides the potential to transform the finance industry by automating and optimizing various processes. So there are a couple of things like, you know, financial document search and synthesis, conversational finance, financial analysis, as I mentioned about the, you know, talk about little bit about financial document and search and synthesis. This Gen AA algorithm can analyze data from contracts, policies, credit memos, and underwriting, trading, lending, and so on to help the bank employees effectively find and understand their customer information. And conversational finance perspective, it can help to create a process one-to-one -one -one personalized message at scale using conversational languages and it can help improve the customer experience and their retention and their cross, cross sales. <clears throat> and these are a couple of AA finance use cases. It can reduce the manual entry and it can provide overall productivity. It can enhance it and you now it can they integrate with the civil financial applications. And the, we talked something about this one on AI knowledge month, like, you know, it can search the uh, customer service request, you know, system, and it can provide the document, you know, knowledge management, and that can be helpful for the users who are using it. And loyalty use case, it can analyze the data, and it can give, you know, it can uh, provide the, uh, like, you know, campaign generations, and uh, it can, give a suggestion for the accrual redemption concepts, and you can provide the recommended products, services, everything more towards loyalty programs. And configuring, configuring the product configurations, it can provide that, uh, you know, uh, customized configuration with the uh, accurable information, and you can analyze their customer previous product information and, and you know, provide the details over here and you know, it's overall like you know, it helps the customer, you know, customer or users to do the product configurations. And from the horizontal application perspective, it can create the SR descriptions and enable natural language search when the users are typing the information, something like show me the account name, something like you know, created by Saravana. It can pull the data and it can give the details, like you know, how many accounts has been created with the name of Saravana. 
or like you know, user by creator by surround. So that information and it can call the any information and provide the data like you know, 360 view, generate graphical charts, everything it can provide. And manufacturing industries, yes, it provides a vital role, pivotal role towards the manufacturing industries as well. And there are a couple of challenges like uh, involves here. So it's like, you know, uh, it can potentially produce incorrect and misleading information, which can lead to the serious consequences to the IT field. For example, the introduction of malware or the incorrectly recommending turning of functionalities, which is used to secure the IT environment from the malicious actors. And it can, it's a dependence on the AI generative content. It company, if companies becomes too reliant on AI generative content, they may not prioritize the human generated one or critical thinking skills uh, that leads to a potential loss of expertise. Despite our, all the discussions around generative AI, a human oversight is still required to validate accuracy and approve the generative information. And there are a couple of ethical concerns, like uh, the ethical concerns surrounding the use of generative AI, like potential bias, the data used to train the model, which can put, you know, which can give us uh, inequalities and it can lead to inequalities as well. And there are a couple of things we need to uh, know, consider when we are building the governance of generative AI. So uh, we need to define the clear objective, what we are going to deploy as part of generative AI and establishing the new governance policy, like business would establish governance policies that defines governance AI, will, will, what, you know, what will be used, who will be responsible for its use and how it will be monitored and audited. And it needs to ensure the transparency is like business should ensure that generative AA is transparent and explainable. This will help build trust with the customers and ensure generative AA is used ethically and responsibility, responsibly. And somebody needs to monitor the generative and uh, monitor and audit the generative AA. Like you know, business would monitor and audit generative AA to ensure that it's being used ethically and responsibly. This will help potentially risk and ensure generative AI is used in compliances with regulation and ethical standards. And we need to train the employees, like business to train the employees how to use uh, the generative AI and ensure that they are understanding the ethical and legal compliances of its use. This will help ensure that generative AI is used in you know all manners. And these are the futures of generative AI can be, you know, in, used as a, a educational tools and it can improve their language translation and in understanding hyper-realistic virtual environments. And, you know, these are the overall future of generative AI and the futuristic of possibility of generative AI can, you know, help the personalize customer interactions and virtual CRM assistance for users real-time predictive analysis for sales, autonomous customer support through A, seamless integrations for insights, A, assisted sales, lead management, and it can you know, use the enhanced UX with A driven UI. And it can schedule, it can do the scheduling and reminders uh, for uh, <clears throat> field service perspective. And overall, like, you know, uh, we talked about the generative A with Siebel, and this is our company details. Like, you know, this of course has been founded by 2005 from San Diego. We have a couple of locations in India, Delhi, Tokyo, Japan. And our we have our own expertise on Siebel, and we've been the partner with RFL for past 15 plus years. And we have our own Siebel Innovation Lab where we are, uh, like, you know, uh, doing a lot of testings and doing the cloud migrations, you know, testings like, you know, migrating to OCA, AWS, bring your own database with OCA migration. And primarily we focus on OCA and we still, you know, have that, you know, uh, uh, using AWS and Google Cloud and um, uh, other, micro, what is it, Microsoft Azure. And uh, we are, you know, we have 
or using the Siebel Upgrade Factory. Thanks, Alex, for sharing the Siebel Upgrade Factory documents. It's really helpful for us to implement. Siebel, you know, they're using Siebel Upgrade Factory for migrating that lower environment to the um, lower patch to the higher patch. And we are we are doing a lot of things like, you know, we have the new CACD pipelines and uh, we have the expertise on the Kubernetes and Dockers. And we need the Siebel Autonomous Database it's you know, really you know easy for us to do the OC migrations. And yeah, overall, that's it, uh, Alex. Do you have any questions? Anybody has any questions? Please feel free to ask. Or uh, if you want to you know, check with me later some point of time, you can reach me out. I can give my email ID. Alex can give my email yeah. ID. Uh, yes. yes. Th th thank, th thank, you, thank you so very much, uh, Saravana, for for this. It's uh, very, very helpful um, to understand the challenges of AI and all those use cases. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, if if anyone has any uh, questions, follow up with Saravana. I'm sure you you will stick around uh, for a while. Uh, let's, and uh, you can put uh, you can put your email address in the chat so everyone can pick it up. Yeah, uh, sure. I, I would I would uh, continue now with uh, with Aaron from GMC. So there's enough time for the presentation to fit in the hour. And then if people are interested having more conversations about AI or the stuff that Aaron uh, will uh, show us now, uh, the the meeting will stay open longer than uh, the hour. So I'm happy to stick around. Okay, so. Yeah, without further ado, it's Aaron is already on it. So let's uh, oh, let's give it up for Aaron. Thank you, Alex. Um, yeah, so I'm from the GMC um, and we'll be giving a demo on our REST-based um, homepage. So it'll be me and it'll be James McDonald. Um, James is more of the, the technical Siebel um, guru. I'm more of the front end and the JavaScript guy. Um, so the idea of the homepage was we wanted a way to present information to users um, in a, a quick to view, up to date way. Um, we had the homepage, but it wasn't being utilized. Um, so what we did was we created a POC for a select set of users to see if we could align the data that they need on a day-to-day -day basis and pop it into a, an area on the homepage for them to view. Um, probably should have asked at the start, you can see my screen, can't you? Yeah. Yep, cool. Okay, so this is what we've got here. This is what we've come up with. So this is our homepage. So this is what every user that logs into SQL Public Sector will see. Um, so this is built using uh, Vue.js. So we use Vue Free. We're using the Composition API. Um, we're using Pinea for our state management. And we're using um, Vite to package everything up into a JavaScript file and putting that in the static files and referencing that. Um, so the way that this works is when you initially load a view it will detect what view that is it will say is this view defined in the list in the view uh, files if it is defined in that file then it will mount to that view um, which obviously why we're on the home page it mounted it here um, now the main functionality is <clears throat> we have this top header section here which contains the global search so most of you, if you were there for the um, the Siebel Assist, you may have already seen a variation of this. But the idea of this is that you can search for lots of different useful bits of data. Um, James is probably better kind of giving a bit of an overview of this um, on the the back end and whatnot. Um, if you if you want to do that, James. Uh, yeah. So something we wanted for a while is kind of a single place to search across multiple entities. So if you see those tabs across the top, it, it's not all of those, but we've probably got about a dozen or so entities that we wanted to kind of search across um, from a single input box. Um, so what I did is built a kind of Oracle PLC, a PLC SQL package that basically takes some key data from those entities and inserts it into a single table, a very kind of skinny but long table. Uh, and then we have a job that runs every hour that does a delta to say since it last ran, is there anything changed? So it does basically an upsert effectively into that table. And then every week we, we basically truncate it and rebuild it from scratch to kind of clean it up in case there are any deletes because it doesn't take care of deletes, but we don't really delete a lot of data. So but that was there as a belt of braces. Uh, but it's really you just using Oracle's kind of standard context searching 
Um, so you, we can do kind of fuzzy matching. We can, it does um, uh, scoring. It's got built-in scoring. So we've got it kind of configured in a way that based on the username, um, their position and the search term that's entered and the type of data it is, it kind of gives it different weighting. So that the results are kind of returned with the, the records of the highest weighting. Um, and then once the data is returned, they can then kind of drill down on any of those records to, to kind of, uh, uh, and it'll effectively do a native go to view um, with the ID of that record. So it takes it to that specific record on that view. Um, it also looks at their, their visibility rules. So if they're on, if it's a, if they're on the kind of my um, visibility of um, a record, then it might take them to one or two different views. So if on the my, it might take them to my view, but if they're not got uh, my visibility to a record, it'll take them to an all view. So they can kind of still see it. So we have a little bit of logic there as well. Um, yeah, that's really it. Yep, cheers, James. Just navigate back to the home page. <clears throat> So you see we've got um, skeleton loaders. So whilst those components load in the background, it'll just overlay that skeleton loader. Um, the way that these components here work, you'll see they've all got their own names. What basically happens is when you navigate to this view, it runs a REST call to your employee record and it returns a list of components that you should have access to. <clears throat> Once it's returned that list, it will then render those components onto the view instance. Um, so most users may only have one or two of these components, but because we're in dev, we've got, I think, about 25 here. Um, up to now, we've built 51 separate components for different various teams. Um, so that is how it works. Um, the next part is we have this new functionality. There's nothing really interesting about that. That just takes you to various parts of the other, uh, other systems that we've built using Vue. Um, so we've got an intelligence form and we've got a safeguarding form. Um, the next part is the key tasks. So key tasks are a way for users to kind of highlight important information within their components. So for instance, if I open this, you'll see I've got no key tasks in here. If I go to my cases component, it'll open up this list of data here. And if I want to mark, say this is an important task to me, I can mark that as a key task. It'll tell me that that's been updated and then I can go in here and I can keep track of that. So when I come back to my homepage in the future, I can have a quick look at this key tasks section, say, what key tasks have I marked? And then I can find them or I can drill down on them and you know, get the relevant information from those. Equally, you can unmark the task and it will update the relevant data and update the relevant areas. Um, so that's key tasks. We then also have um, recently viewed. So if at any point you drill down on something, so say for instance, if I drill down here, so I'll say 969, if I drill down to this one. Da -da -da. It may take a while because we're in dev, but hopefully it's pretty fast. Yeah, I would say it's the native go to view is it's the slowest part of the entire process, actually. <laughs> it's, it's... Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's took us to the relevant place. Um, if we now go back, go back to the home page. Load. If we now go to recently viewed, you'll see that the record that we recently drilled down on is at the top of the list. And um, so we have two types of recently viewed. We have the main recently viewed, which contains decisions, inquiries, um, cases, and all that stuff. And then we have stuff specific to activities and SRs where you can drill down on those. Um, so that is recently viewed. Um, you'll notice when I came back to the home page that the cases component was already expanded and that's because we have um, persistence across all of our components. So for instance, because I expanded this and I've done a drill down from this component, it remembers that I've done that. So when I next come into this, it will open that by default. Equally, if I was in, for instance, the decision tracker and I was on say decisions and I'd set a filter on this, if I was to drill down on this record, Oh, 
and then go back to the home page. What you'll see when it loads is that it's opened up the decisions tab. It's still got the filter there and it's filtered me straight back to the place that I was when I initially drilled down on the record. Um, so that's the persistence that we've got there. And we also have persistence across um, each table. So we have the ability to toggle the columns and depending on the settings that you set here. So if I hide that and I navigate away, when I come back, then it will automatically remember that and it will re-invoke the, the columns that I have chosen. Um, now, the way that these tables work, we have a, a JavaScript file or mappings file that basically gets the field key from the REST call and matches it to a field in the table. Um, we then use a separate file called a formatter file that then formats how that should look. So we can do conditional formatting. So if there was a date, for instance, and we wanted to format it in a certain way, or we wanted to prepend it with an icon or something, we could do that. Um, and we've done that with the, um, the drill down. So obviously with drill downs, we've got a generic function that determines if that field is a drill down, it will go to the relevant place. You just pass in the relevant information. Um, so that is that. Um, what else have we got? So we have um, one bit of functionality that we've got is the ability to look at um, subsets of data. So for instance, we've got a case here. You'll see that we have this drop down arrow um, and that will allow us to expand the record so that we can see all of the hearings. We can see the case team attached to that case um, and we can see the decisions attached to that case. So it allows us to view lots more information without having to go to different views within Siebel and equally it allows us to drill down within those views to see that information um, in more detail if we wanted to. Um, and then following on from that, we have, I think it's this one, we have an extension to that where we have in this one we have SRs and we can attach attachments to SRs so we can click the plus icon and what that will do is it will load this form um, and we can drag and drop a file so if I drop this file in there you'll see we can upload that file there automatically change it to be a document so automatically added the information and um, if we remove that and we go and add a email we can drag that in and you'll see it automatically changes the type to be an email inbound and equally all of these are being pulled from LOVs using various REST calls. Those REST, those results are then cached so the next time you come in the, the request is significantly faster. Um, so we can do that and we can save it and that would attach that to that record. Um, let me save that for instance and that will go away and we'll save it and then assuming that it is successful it will tell us that the activity has successfully been created and we can then drill down on that and we could see that activity attached to that SR um, so that is that one <clears throat> um, what else have we got to cover um, you got new record you've already seen uh, new record uh, do, 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 do I have a component with a new record I do. So you can create new records as well. Um, I don't think I have a component to be able to demo that. Um, but yeah, we have the ability to create new records. We have the ability to update records. So for instance, on this component, we have the ability to um, reject or accept these requests. So I think um, these come in from another system called GMC Connect. Um, these come into the queue and it allows the users within this group to just approve or reject them. Um, so there's validation run here. So obviously you click on it, allows you to click a button. We click reject. It doesn't allow us to enter anything because we've got validation that says you need to enter a reject reason. Um, and if we were to enter a reject reason and step off the record, again, it will tell us that we've updated it. So we have this toast component that will always look for when you've updated a field in the background and it will prompt you to tell you that you've done something successfully or you've failed to do something. Um, Equally, there is um, da, 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 there is concurrency. So if, for instance, I go to, let's say, activities, and I go to this one, if I open up another session and go to activities, so say there are two users editing the same field at the same time, so I update it in this session, step off it, successfully updated. If I now go in here and try to make a change to that, what will happen is I'll step off it and it'll pop up this error telling me that someone else has changed the record um, and it will undo the change that I've just made, pull in that new record and refresh that table so that if I was to now go into that component and make another change, 
it will successfully change it. Um, so that is concurrency. Uh, what else do we have? We have a decision allocator component. And so da -da -da, let me go to, where is it? Da -da -da -da, decision allocator. So this component, um, apparently this component alone has saved the team that use it uh, on average three business days per week because the previous process was to do a handover with a Excel spreadsheet um, every lunchtime. Um, so this has saved a lot of time and the fact that we can limit the fields that are being edit that, that you can edit um, means that the the data quality has also increased on this particular um, this particular team's um, area. Um, and then what else have we got? We've also got some other technical stuff. So we've got, for instance, um, what's called an abort controller. So for all of the REST requests that get sent to the server, if at any point we decide we want to abandon that request, we can pass in um, an abort signal, which will stop on the client side. It will stop the request. Um, it'll still go to the server, obviously, and make the request to the server side, but it will free up the client to be able to kind of navigate wherever you want at that point rather than having to sit in the background and wait for that REST request to come back. Um, so it will cancel that out. Um, is there anything else? Uh, there's lots of stuff that we could go through. Oh, there's <coughs> one bonus thing to go through is there is also a dark theme. <laughs> so everything that you've seen, but in a lovely dark mode. Um, might be worth mentioning kind of more of the back end stuff. Um, yes. Yeah. So there's a couple of questions on that. So we are just using standard Siebel REST API for this. However, before we did the homepage, we had only a small number of inbound REST calls and they were all using um, uh, anonymous authentication because um, that was kind of sufficient. However, you'll see from some of these components where they kind of got my visibility or teams or something that we wanted to kind of use native view modes um, so we configured an additional AI object manager with single sign-on uh, and we pass in the user's windows, uh, the, the user's name and their windows login name uh, in the header with the associable user. So that when you make the request, it, it's kind of run in the context of that user. Um, that way we could just use standard components and the standard visibility without doing any extra kind of config. Um, the other area where we've had to kind of i guess go a little bit off piste is you'll see some of these views where we've got clearly some aggregation going on and um we didn't want to kind of use you know vbcs and scripts you know it's it's it's, it's very slow so we're using the, the raw power of sql so we have probably i don't know maybe about 15 20 database views now um or using some type of aggregation usually some like manager view or something where we're doing counts and, and various things um, and we basically import those as external database views and do the standard EBC stuff. Um, so we have an EBC, and then we just build integration object on top of that. We're using all the, the native data um, APIs. Um, so um, they're all prefixed base, you know, the old style. I, I know you've got the dynamic thing in, uh, introduced fairly recently, but we're still configuring our own integration objects. Um, I prefer doing that anyway, because you can make them nimble, you know, just have just the fields that you want and stuff, make them fast. Um, so, um, so we've got some of those and we've always kind of said that only on the proviso that th the performance is, is pretty good. When I say pretty good, you know, within a couple of seconds or something. And most of these are, even most of the aggregate ones are kind of sub seconds. We've got a couple, which are maybe a take a few seconds usually where we go into activities because we've got a lot of activities in the system. Um, but generally it's pretty good. Um, I mean, traditionally, I suppose you would have used analytics, but our analytics is only updated nightly. So if we'd built it on top of a, um, some analytics feed, then the data would be stale. Whereas the advantage we've got is that everything's in real time. Uh, and that makes a big difference to some of our business users who previously would have navigated across multiple tabs several times a day to try and work out you know, how much work the team members have got. Um, now they can go to a, a component and it's there sub-second. They can kind of see what the state of play is at any time of day. So it's made kind of a big difference to them. And uh, Dan, I don't know if you've got any idea on hours, but 
I know some teams have kind of saved hours a week in um in in, in the time saved just by <clears throat> showing me information in real time. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I we haven't done the um we haven't gone back around. We we're planning to go back to the teams and say you know try and do a sum up of all the time saved. But I definitely think it will go into the many well you know two, three, four, FTE, I reckon, when we add it all up across, you know, the whole GMC. I know one team, for example, they used to spend literally days a month, one person going through analytics reports that are out of date to get all the data uh, required to sort of, um, to notify external regulators about issues with doctors in this country. And now it all just appears automatically in real time on the view. And they literally, I think, click a button and it sends an email off to the to the relevant people. So it takes them minutes rather than days literally so um yeah i think these are these are going down very well and um, we've created a bit of a mini industry now creating these so i think like i haven't said we've done 50 i think there's 18 in the pipeline so i suspect we'll get up to at least 150 or something yeah let me i suppose as if has anyone got any questions at all Hi, hi guys, it's John here um, from Oracle. Um, it's kind of like a, a homepage of widgets, right? Um, with just the key sort of functionality that a person needs to do things like quickly. Um, I remember that's a stupid question. I was going to ask what's led you down this path, but I think I'm kind of saying do things quickly. It's probably where the starting point was. Too many button clicks, too many navigations, I guess. Um, too much clutter on the screen. Is that what started started you off on this journey? I, yeah, I, I'll well, I mean, I'll make a start. I mean, maybe James or Aaron can come in, but it's a good question, um, John. I, to be honest, I'm trying to think because I think it was partly me that you know that kind of drove this idea, as it were. And I know James and you know, yeah, I, I, I think it may have been previous demos, some other you know events such as this, where I'm trying to think which client it was. Um, may have done something slightly similar in the past. We saw that, and thought that looked like quite a good idea. I suppose maybe looking at other apps like Salesforce and seeing what's sort of going on there. But as you say, I think, I think for us, our biggest complaint is you know we have many hundreds of operational users that are spending hours and hours and hours every day going through work queues. You know, because we have a lot. You know, we get inbound letters, inbound. Um, emails of people just having to go through work queues looking for work to do you know the work doesn't come to them as it were they've got to go through service requests activities cases inquiries all over the place you know standard Siebel design so we were sort of keen to try and turn that around and 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 do away with all those out-of-date reports and lists and things like that and try and bring the work to them in a single place so you know your question is a good one john why is it all in one place why is it all on the home page i think it's a good question you know and, and in time we may break it out and embed it um but i think this is a bit of an evolution um in terms of our thinking we are working on a new complete revamp of the siebel ux along the lines of these home pages and we're going to sort of apply that theme across the entire application and then in which case we might um look to you know just break it out i suppose and embed it more seamlessly into the application so i guess it's the start of the journey and could can you take these building blocks behind these widgets and, and expose them in other systems easily um well yeah go on now and you take them on <laughs> we guys were building portals and things outside of Seawall before, right? Yes. So because everything is built in Vue, you can literally, and it, it's just pointing to a REST endpoint, you can take that component and you can use it absolutely anywhere. So it's like Dan was saying, if we were at some point to split these components off, there would be literally no work in moving it to a different area. It'd be a case of saying, point this component to this new view, and that would be it. Um, it would work exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, I I had a question in the chat about, I mean, you know, in Siebel, you have sort of like UI level specialized code and UI level customized code behind buttons and things that you guys might have put in there over the years, right? Um, I had a question whether you wanted to invoke that functionality from these widgets or, you know, a portal outside of Siebel. Uh, I mean, I'm potentially at some point. Um... I don't think we've got a, a use case for it at the minute because um, these are very much read-only and updating very small subsets yeah. of data. 
Yeah, I suppose one thing I overlooked mentioning was when we built the uh, the Siebel side of it. So for most of these components, we built dedicated business components um, because Aaron, as Aaron said, it's read only and and I mean, there's a few exceptions, but most of it is read only. So we didn't need all the heavyweight scripting that we've got on some of our business components. So again, to make it faster, you know, it was it was a BC with the minimal number of fields on it, and therefore the integration component kind of mirrored that. Um, yeah, the the API generator feature that the guys are building at the moment is specifically designed towards customers who are looking for a more microservice and headless operation of the Siebel application. So we can automatically expose the UI level processes and things like that to you know, via API, right, to other systems. So if that does sound like it's of interest to you, then, you know, let me know. We can um, set up a call with our PM lead and you can give you a walkthrough of that, that functionality. Uh -huh. Plus, it'll help us to capture your feedback as well. I, I think it would be, for what it's worth, John. I mean, I'll have a chat with Aaron and you know James next week. But we've, funnily enough, we, like I mentioned in the chat, I don't know whether it quite addresses your question, but, you know, we're working on rebuilding the Engage application that's built out of OpenUI. And, it's you know, it's going to be run, not running Siebel. You know, it will not be running off a Siebel object manager. It'll be a standalone application. But also, we were talking about, we rolled out something recently, the ability for every user of the GMC to be able to record a safeguarding concern, which is, you know, something which is quite important at the GMC. But lots of the users, quite a few staff at the GMC are not Siebel users. They've never logged into Siebel. And it was, the, you know, it's like, well, how are we going to, you know, we, we can have to roll out training for someone to raise a safeguarding concern, you know, once every five years. And I think that's a great use case. James and I were just talking about it to potentially put the safeguarding form, you know, on our intranet, but it, but not to run. See, you know, you don't have to log into Siebel, just basically click a button and it will just launch a little form that's basically writing data back to Siebel um, in, I guess, headless mode. Would that be the right term for that, I suppose? But, you know, you're basically not running the Siebel application and you wouldn't need to be a Siebel user to better do that. Yeah, it's, it's exactly the this kind of use case where we're aiming for, right? Headless operation, but you know, you might have a process that you've already built in the Siebel application to perform some kind of validation on a safeguarding concern, right? And yeah. Instead of having to rewrite that whole process again, just so it can be accessed through REST API, you know, to the business layer, we've created a feature that exposes those UI level process executions through a REST API and preserves all of your configurations as well. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's like I said, it's in beta. Um, so we're actively talking to customers to capture feedback, use cases, make sure we're doing things correctly and all that kind of stuff. Um, but also, you know, you, you get an, an insight into <clears throat> what it's going to look like and, and how it works as well. One forgot our members, one kind of gotcha that we've hit a couple of times. Um, I mentioned about database views that we've built for, you know, aggregation and things like that. Um, there were a couple that I built where technically from a SQL perspective, they worked perfectly fine and you could run a select form and get the data you wanted. However, when you configured it in Siebel and tried to make a REST call via the integration object, you would get an error saying next record is not available or can't be read or something. Um, and there is a, an SR on this, and it basically says that there are certain, there's some SQL that SQL can't cope with dynamically when you run it, even though technically the SQL is perfectly fine. But it well, doesn't document what it is. It just says, rewrite it until it works, is basically what it says. Uh, and in both cases, I was able to rewrite it a different way and get it to work. But I think that's the only thing we've kind of really hit a temporary issue with. Oh, all right. So, yeah, please, please uh, yeah, put your hands together for, for this uh, incredible presentation from GMC. Uh, very much appreciated. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, James. Thanks, Dan, for being here. Yeah, uh, it was literally uh, great to see that you can put standard Siebel uh, technology together to build a modern solution portable, etc. Yeah, so great stuff here. And I'm sure there's much more to say about this and also about Saravana's presentation. So 
I'm happy to keep the room open if there's need for more Q&A and discussions. So it's Zebel Friday, so the room is yours. And uh, there's no more planned presentations for now. So if anybody wants to drop off, has to be somewhere else, uh, of course, uh, the, the recording will be up there in a yeah, few days on YouTube. So thanks again very much to everybody who presented today and for the very lively discussions in the chat. Okay. Alex, yeah, thanks, I'll... Alex. Um, I mean, uh, just for the guys from the US who are on the call, happy Thanksgiving for yesterday. And for the guys, you know, in, in Europe, um, we had some really good roadshow events over the last few weeks. Um, yes, we did. <laughs> and, you know, if you weren't there, definitely make the effort to come next time around. We had, um, I, don't know, I mean, I went to three of the events and there's about six or seven customer presentations, um, all fantastic presentations around Seaboard and innovation and things like that. An incredibly funny presentation from Net Cologne. <laughs> Stick to the memory. Um, so, you know, I know sometimes it might feel like a bit of a pain to travel and stuff, but I feel it's worth it just to engage with other customers face to face and socialize a little bit as well. Um, and yeah. Yeah, the best way to find out about this, those events is like, like, you know, I post in the LinkedIn group and I also put it on the Siebel blog. Um, and I think Alex, you're going to try and, uh, you know, publish it a bit more as well on the Siebel hub. So if you're following those channels, you will know about it. Yes. Uh, thanks, John. And I would also like to come back to your chat message of, from earlier on where you say you are looking to establishing a, a focus group on, on AI. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, so, we're already seeing um, customers using Oracle's OCI AI services with Siebel. Um, we're already seeing proof of concepts of generative AI services working with Siebel. Um, Oracle's doing its own kind of proof of concepts with Cohere's generative AI services that are currently in beta with, um, you know, applications that we have in the cloud and the same kind of principles will totally apply to Siebel. Um, you can imagine just how much time and effort needs to be put in and resources for this kind of thing. We just want to make sure we're heading in the right direction from the start. Um, and focusing on the right things so i want to try and establish a fairly small focus group um of of customers and partners that have actively been doing work in that area with siebel right so i know a lot of people will be interested in it but that's not going to help in a focus group we want people who are actively hands-on and then we'll progress the focus group and um naturally we will feed that back into our um cab webinars and you know even on siebel hub meetings like this we'll feed back the progress and the direction of where we're going so if anyone's interested in anyone's hands-on and been trying those things you know get in touch with me or, or, or alex yeah sure uh, and so everybody who you heard the call from john so everybody who has actively already get their hands dirty with siebel and ai yeah, that's a great chance to or maybe or maybe the business has challenged them right maybe the bill the business has said you know we, we've got so much siebel data and we've identified some use cases for generative ai you know go figure it out if, if that's the situation you're in then reach out as well uh -huh. we want to hear the use cases yeah okay so um, I'm checking the chat, uh, so there's no nothing specific to the presentations in the chat, but uh, very good feedback I see there. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, so anything else? Maybe just one thing, come back on what John was asking about, why do we build stuff in one view? Um, and I think a few people touched on it in terms of 
users having to navigate to lots of different places to find what they want. So it's kind of part of it, but it's also the kind of um, the performance, you know, when you hit a view, the number of files that are kind of pulled down, like kind of manifest and, and whatnot, you know, Aurora CSS is quite big. Um, so, you know, performance has always been a key driver in all of this. Um, it's just kind of, that's kind of underpinning a lot of the stuff we're doing with our homepage. Um, cause a lot of feedback we get from the users is around performance. So it's, it's something that we're trying hard to kind of tackle. Yeah. And uh, so, so it was mentioned in the chat that what you showed is the development, uh, view of an administrator. So it gets everything and the real users just have three, four, five of yeah. these of these um widgets let's call it that yeah exactly which is more like a home more like a traditional siebel home page with five six applets yes yeah that's right, right yeah right. Um, we're just working around around the business teams or one of our bas is um we're just capturing what they need and if we've got a component already brilliant we assign it to them and if if we haven't then you know yeah, we build another one okay. develop one yeah so it's, I think you referred to, there was a demo where uh, we demonstrated a dashboard of sorts using the same technique, uh, using the Siebel REST API to get data aggregated and show a lazy loading dashboard. Uh, kind of reminded me of that. And just to confirm, you used Vue.js for, for, for the front end? Yeah, yeah, use J, yeah, yeah Vue.js. Yeah. Okay, so, and... It's particularly interesting for, let's say, open UI developers who aspire for, for uh, let's say, more professional look and feel than, let's say, jQuery. Uh, so, Vue.js, did did you learn? Did you learn it, or did you, did you have experience already, or what, what uh, was how was the learning yeah. curve? <laughs> I mean, it's a lot. E Personally, I found it a lot easier to understand than something like Open UI. I mean, although Open UI is just an extension of JavaScript. For me, Vue yeah. just makes a lot more sense because it's kind of a lot more um, modern, and you know, you, you can kind of you can look up examples um, yes. that other people have built and kind of build stuff off that. Whereas Open UI, it's a bit um, more difficult, and obviously jQuery is a bit outdated. So, right. um, it's yeah, it, it's definitely better working with something like Vue because it's like you say, it's modern. Um, I mean, maybe it would have been good to work with something like React, but we chose Vue because um, we have other teams that are developing other products that use Vue, so it made That's, sense to align. That, that will have been my next question, so why Vue, yeah. not React? It's because it's yeah. an in-house, you're already using Vue. And exactly, yeah. have, to, have the expertise there. Yeah, it's it's developer-driven development, I call it. <laughs> or skill-driven <laughs> Uh, you use what you used to do. Uh, so, so Nick asks, is there a guide for dummies or to building that. So Nick, I have uh, that dashboard is, uh, is it's not using Vue.js, uh, it's using the more down to earth uh, jQuery, but still uh, the underlying technique of using the REST API, single sign on for the, vi the visibility in Siebel to get the same user rights. Uh, there is a YouTube video out there. I'll, I'll, I'll dig it out and send you the link. Okay, so yeah, with that, I think a great Black Siebel Friday is coming to a conclusion. So thanks. Yeah, we should we should all be shopping, right? <laughs> right, yeah. You should, you should go go off to Amazon. You go and shop. <laughs> We're saving money now. In the UK, we're off to the pub right now. This is 100% beer. Indeed. <laughs> okay, off to the pub you go. Hope everyone else has a good weekend. Have everybody have a great weekend and see you on next Table Friday. Maybe this year, maybe next year. I'll let you know. Thanks, Alex. Alex. Thank Alex. Alex. Bye, bye. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye. Thanks.